All right, there's still some people trickling in. Do you guys want to wait another minute or let's get started? I think we can get started. Get started? Okay, awesome. Well, aloha everyone and good evening. Welcome to the second week of the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month or HISAM. Um, we greatly appreciate you folks being here. Um, tonight's webinar will cover 10 emergent pests in Hawaii presented by Aaron Bishop and Jamie Miller of the Oahu Invasive Species Committee. Before we get started, just a quick um, few housekeeping rules regarding Zoom, which is the platform we're using. Um, if anyone has any questions at any time, because you're not allowed to share your screens or unmute, um, we're asking that you use the Q&A box at the bottom. So to find that box, you just hover your, um, your cursor down to the bottom of the screen and there should be a box that says Q&A. And there you can type in the questions and we will address all questions at the end. Um, if we have time and we should have some time. Um, what we're going to be doing now before we get started is just a quick poll. Um, this poll is about the demographics of, um, of everyone here tonight, and it just helps us to figure out where our audiences are coming from and how we can better improve for the future. So I am going to launch this um, poll. If everybody can please just take a few seconds to answer each question, we're just going to give you guys a quick minute for the three questions. Um, it's just asking about where your primary residence is, what island or continental U.S. if you're from, um, field of employment, you know, and how did you hear about this event? So we'll give you folks from, some time. Um, field of employment, you know, and how did you hear about this event? So we'll give you folks some time. Uh oh, is there an echo? Sorry. Okay, just another 10 more seconds and we'll end the poll. So thank you very much for filling this out. All right, let's end this. We'll just quickly share our results. It looks like majority of us are from Oahu, but we also have some Hawaii Island and Maui folks joining us as well. Um, we have uh, people from the conservation, natural resources, um, industry, education, and hospitality. Welcome, military as well, and others. And it looks like we have a wide range of how people heard about this through friends, email, Facebook, Instagram. So welcome. I'm going to stop sharing. And without further ado, let's get started. And we'll get started with uh, Miss Erin Bishop. Um, take it away. Thanks. We appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Uh, Amber, we appreciate you hosting. And Jamie's going to go ahead and share her screen so that we can get the presentation going here for you. So tonight, we just wanted to provide an overview of some of the most concerning emergent pests in the state. Um, so these are 10 plants and animals that are not yet widely established across Hawaii. Some islands have never even had detections, but as we know, hitchhiking pests can arrive at any time. So we really want people to be on the lookout for these emergent pests. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna do a quick review of what it really means to be an invasive species here in Hawaii. And next slide. When we talk about native species, this is any plant or animal that arrived with, um, out the help of human beings to Hawaii. That's the easiest definition. So they got here either by the wind, wing, or wave, and it was on their own accord. Non-native species are any plants and animals that arrived to Hawaii with um, the help of human activity. So these were accidental or intentional introductions. And then when we think of invasive species, these are things um, that are non-native species that cause harm. More specifically, they have to harm the environment, economy, or human health. The worst invasive species, things like mosquitoes, harm all three of those aspects. It's important to the topic tonight that we really understand why early detection is so important to invasive species management. So here is the invasion curve. It's very common um, and commonly discussed in natural resource management. And it really represents the cost that invasive species have to natural resources and the economy. 
and also representing the cost that it um, happens to mitigate these species impacts once they start to spread. The best thing that we could do was to stop them from coming at all. This means effective biosecurity, but even with the best biosecurity, you can't catch everything. So detecting an invasive species early allows for efficient eradication. If eradication is impossible, um, either because we don't have the tools, the funding, or maybe even the research in order to control these, that's when we look at containment, and that might be a priority as these tools are being developed. So some species, there's not a lot known about them, so research needs to happen. And when we think about the early detection and that rapid response working in that area where you can get the most done with the least amount of resources, that's where we think about the invasive species committees. We work locally to detect, eradicate, and contain, and also educate the public about invasive species. Because invasive species don't hit the state um, at the same time, some islands will get it first. Um, some islands have widespread issues. Some islands have small localized issues. The invasive species committees are set up to tackle the issues that affect their community locally. So there's a BISC, MISC, MOMISC, OISC, and a KISC. And even though we all have a very similar mission, we oftentimes have different targets. So education is very important because we want people to know about things that are coming to the island. And sometimes this makes the news. Um, a lot of these are the, the sexy news stories. So these are things like giant coconut crabs, venomous spiders, snakes, skunks, possums, uh, people trying to sell poison dart frogs, iguanas. This is easily grabbing people's attention. And if you were to see any of these things, it'd be pretty easy to know that you should call someone. But these are sensational creatures and the ones that we're gonna talk about today, next slide, um, they really aren't the things that might grab your attention. So we wanted to highlight some of these. And so with that, um, what we'd want you to know mostly about these species is just an update, what, where they are on the islands, what's being done. And if we leave you with anything tonight, we really want you to know how to report suspect species. So we'll go through these 10 emergent pests and I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie to do the first five. And that's off to you, Jamie. All right, thanks so much, Erin. So we are going to kick off today talking about the two-line spittle bug. The two-line spittle bug has been detected in Hawaii Island only so far. Um, it's important to be on the lookout for this pest in pastures, farms, or even on roadsides. And it has a big impact on our agriculture. So the native range for the two-line spittlebug is actually the southeastern mainland U.S. And it first was detected in Hawaii in 2016 in Kona on the Big Islands. And it's actually still only detected in Kona and particularly at higher elevations. And it was likely brought in with imported plant materials. The response right now for this pest is through the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. So they're handling um, the response along with the two line spittle bug task force. And um, their website is down there, the tlsbhawaii.com if you wanna check them out. And they are dedicated to this pest. So what's some of the damage that the two, two line spittle bug is causing? Well, what it does is it feeds by sucking nutrients and fluids from the plant stem, and that causes the grass to totally die. Unlike with some other pests where the plant would regenerate, this causes a total death of the plant. And that's what you're seeing here with this dead grass, where it's really dead all the way down to the ground. Um, and then you might see some regeneration after this from new seed stock that's in the ground, but then the um, pest gets on that new grass and also wipes that out as well. So the two-line spittle bug is now impacting more than 175,000 acres um, and is consuming Big Island pasturate at about the rate of 35,000 acres a year, which is um, causing a really huge impact. And that impact really affects our ranching industry. So the grass in particular that's being lost is Kikuyu and Pingola grass pastures. 
and most of our livestock are dependent on these grasses. So you can see here in the top photo in 2015, there's a healthy pasture. And then four years later, you can see the same pasture. So what happens after the grass dies? Well, that leaves room for all sorts of other invasive species to come in. And that's like fireweed, pomacunny, and blackberry um, are ones that are really taking advantage of that. So here we have, like I said, a healthy pasture. And then just four years later, it's really overrun with all these invasive species. What are some key ID features to spotting the spittle bug? Well, they are a small black leaf hopper and all the pictures we're looking at today are pretty close up, but the spittle bug's on a piece of grass. So you can imagine it's actually really small, um, only about a centimeter long, and it's got those um, two reddish orange lines on it. Now, if you're finding spittle masses around and you're wondering, is it the two line spittle bug? One thing to note is that they'll, if it is, it'll be on the ground soil level. So some other spittle bugs might um, attack different parts of a plant, but the two line spittle bug make their spit mass right at that ground level. And things you can do. Well, Big Island residents are asked to be alert about their lawns and pastures and pay attention to dead patches of grass that can't be explained by other environmental factors. You wanna make sure you report um, any damage or anything suspicious right away to 643 Pest. And the spittle bug is very tiny, especially in its nymph form, and it can easily attach to a plant stem without notice. So it's really important, especially for like hunters and ranch workers that are visiting the Kona area um, to decom their cars and equipment after leaving the area. All right, next bug we're talking, or pest we're talking about today is the Queensland longhorn beetle. And this pest has also only been detected on Hawaii Island so far. You wanna be on the lookout for this pest at nurseries, farms, on trails, or even in yards. Um, and it has a big impact on our agriculture. So the Queensland longhorn beetle is actually native to um, Australia, the Queensland and New South Wales area. And it was accidentally in, introduced to Puna on Big Island and likely from imports coming in from Australia. Um, in 2009, the first beetle was found, and that brings us to almost 10 years later in 2018, when the damage from the beetle really started to become noticeable. Some key ID features for spotting this bug, it's about an inch to two inches long and has a brown and almost like velvet-like appearance. It's got really long antenna, almost could be twice the size of its body, and it's a solid color. Also, you notice the two spines on its neck that I highlighted here. They're a little hard to see since the bug is all the same color, but um, those are pointed out here for you. Now, there are a lot of lookalikes for this species, and BISC actually has their own lookalike guide for longhorns because um, there's several different types. None of them are quite, it seems like really all um, that velvety brown in appearance. We also have a native longhorn beetle, the koa longhorn beetle, and that one um, pictured here, as you can see, is much more almost like leathery and uh, darker brown. So you can visit their guide if you'd like to learn more about that. The Queensland longhorn beetle has a variety of hosts, so it's really not host, host specific. Um, it feeds on a variety of things and affects different crops. It causes damage um, that looks a little bit like what you're seeing here. These perfectly round holes, you might see some sawdust coming out of that hole from frass that um, from the beetle boring into the wood. Um, you might see ooze from the sap from the damaged area, and then some girdling on the trunk as well. Uh, you might also notice some branch dieback, 
So um, seeing branches die, dying back and dropping could mean that um, it's got a Queens and Longhorn beetle. The best strategy for prevention um, with this pest is not moving wood from potentially infested areas. So the Queensland longhorn beetle has not been found outside the Hilo Pahoa Mountain View area. So it's important to make sure that we're not moving any kind of material out of that area that could be infested to a new area. And then of course, if you see any damage or you think you've spotted a beetle, you can report it to 643pest.org. It's important to note that this is an early detection species. So since it's something we're not seeing in other places yet, we wanna make sure we stay ahead of that. All right, the coconut rhinoceros beetle. The CRBs are only found on Oahu and they're important to look out for at nurseries, farms, or in yards. And they have a big impact on agriculture. So they're actually native to Southeast Asia and were first detected in Hawaii in 2013 at Joint Base Pearl Harbor. And genetic testing was done that showed that the beetles that were first found here were actually similar to beetles that were found in Guam. And the beetle has a response team dedicated to it, the coconut rhinoceros beetle response that's um, they are the ones who are focusing and responding to this pest. And then they also receive support from um, OISC as well, who has lists CRBs as their target species. And the impacts that CRBs cause is they're really a major threat to our coconut, royal, date, and palm fan trees. Um, these, if these preferred food sources are unavailable, CRB has no problem shifting to feed on other proms and tropical crops. And I even saw um, recently that they found some damage in a holla tree as well. Another native plant that we're very worried about with CRB is our lolu palms um, because that would be a potential host for CRB. So we worry about them spreading and infesting those as well. And what they do is they use their front legs to dig into the crown of the trees, their front legs and their horn. And then they use their uh, sucking mouth parts to feed on the juices of the inner spear of those palms. And by causing that damage, what happens is when the palm emerges, it has these V-shaped notches in them. So when you're looking at a palm tree, if you notice any of these like V-shaped notches, it's important to go ahead and report it because that could mean that it, it, that palm is being damaged by a CRB. You also might see some bore holes. So I highlighted the bore holes here that you could find. Um, holes like that in a palm tree mean that it could be infested with CRB. And here you can kind of get an up close look at those um, strong forearms that really dig into the plant. Some lookalikes for this species are first a dung beetle. Although dung beetles are not native, they're actually beneficial and were intentionally introduced to Hawaii for the ranching and farming industry. As dung feeders, they're important to our ecosystem and have never actually been recorded damaging any kind of ornamental plants or crops. And they're about a third of the size of a CRB which um, looks super huge here, but as you can, and it is a big bug, it's about the size of your thumb, so about two inches. So in comparison to the oriental flower beetle, that's um, one of the most common lookalikes for the CRB, and they are established on Oahu since about 2002. And although they do seem to be a nuisance at times, their feeding doesn't appear to harm fruiting or flowering productivity of a plant, and they're opportunistic. So they'll even feed on fruit that's just fallen or is injured and maybe opened up by a bird or something. And they're about half the size of a CRB for comparison. Now, what you could also find and what oftentimes you see is actually the larva of CRB or an oriental flower beetle. And pictured here in this video, um, you can see the two moving. 
And you'll see, notice that one, the larger one is moving on its side, whereas the smaller beetle writes itself and ends up actually on its back. So we'll watch that one more time. So the CRB moves on its side and is actually, it's easy to remember if you think of the same shape of a C, whereas the flower beetle will write itself up and scoot on its back with its legs up in the air. So how are CRB moving around? Well, CRB lay their eggs in rotting and decaying plant material, which makes mulch and green race um, a perfect spot for them. And so those are at risk for infestation. While they don't travel very far on their own, what happens is when humans move that mulch or green race to a new location, it's really easy to move um, some CRB larva or eggs around. And that's how um, they're oftentimes getting transported around the island. You can see here uh, recent trap detections. These are from the end of last year, so July 2021 to December. And the, each dot represents where a CRB trap found CRB. And then depending on the color, as it gets from blue to red to yellow, changes how many CRB are detected in that area. So it really gives you a good idea of where the hot spots are for this pest. And in reference to those hot spots, if you are in one of those areas, you really wanna be careful about moving your mulch around and not moving it to a low risk area. Um, same thing if you're in a low risk area, make sure that you're sourcing your mulch somewhere that's not from a high risk area preferably, or if you can't even source it, source it on site. You can report any suspect damage of palms or if you are, think you have found a CRB to 643pest.org. And I have to mention the traps for CRBs, which most of us have seen around the island are these um, kind of lantern bird feeder looking things that are actually CRB traps with some pheromones in them. And these traps are checked about every two weeks by the CRB response team. And all of the CRBs that they catch are actually logged. Um, and that's over 3,000 traps that they have. So it's pretty impressive. All right, next is little fire ants. So little fire ants were first detected um, on Hawaii Island and have now been detected on Maui, Oahu, and Kauai as well. You want to be on the lookout in nursery, farms, and yards for this pest, and it has an impact on our agriculture environment and our human health. So um, they are actually native to South America, and they were first detected in Hawaii in 1999, and since then have been detected, as I said, on all the major islands, basically except Molokai. The response um, we have the Hawaii Ant Lab dedicated to responding to little fire ants and as well as the invasive species committees. So let's talk a little bit about the impacts of little fire ants because they are one of the worst invasive species and they really impact those four different areas. Um, they impact our economy um, by impacting our farms. And you know, once you have an infestation of little fire ants at your farm, it's really hard to um, you know, be sure that it's LFA free before you're selling that product and to get farmers to work with you as well is tough because they don't want to get stung. Um, they harm our human health because of those painful stings. Um, they, that, um, they're also known as electric ants, which is, alludes to how the pain from the sting feels. They're bad for our environment because they not only attack young nesting seabirds, but also our outdoor pets as well. So many of the feral cats on Big Island are known for having cloudy corneas due to the scarring from the stings of little fire ants. And they really change our way of life. Once you have an infestation of little fire ants, you can't enjoy your backyard or you hear we hear stories all the time about infestations on Big Island where you can't enjoy the beach there anymore because, because you don't wanna be stung. 
So what can you do? Well, you can help us look for little fire ants by surveying your property once a year. And this is a um, survey kit and someone surveying with a little bit of peanut butter on the end of a stick in about an hour of time is all it takes. And if you reach out to us, we can provide you with uh, material to survey as well, some survey kits. So how are LFA getting around? Well, it's really easy for little fire ants to spread because their colonies are very small. They can actually fit in the shell of a macadamia nut shell. So once you have a colony on maybe some plants or some cut flowers, even fruit and produce, or even anything that's been sitting for a while, like cars or old construction equipment, if you have that in an area that's infested with little fire ants and then move it to a different one, you could move that colony. So as I mentioned, you can survey your property once a year for little fire ants. Also, when you bring home new plants, you'll wanna quarantine them. Even if it comes from a nursery or somewhere you think doesn't have little fire ants, it's always a good practice to put some peanut butter sticks out for an hour, pick them back up and see if you have any ants that look kind of suspect. And you can of course report any activity to 643 pests, any suspect or um, if you think you might have them. All right, so next on our list is Niothrips. And thrips have only been detected on Hawaii Island and Oahu. You should be on the lookout for these at nurseries, roadsides, and yards. And they impact agriculture and our environment. So their native range is from actually Tasmania and Australia. And they were detected here in 2009 on Hawaii Island. And then almost 10 years later on Oahu. The response right now for thrips, if you're on Big Island or Hawaii Island, you want to make sure to pay attention to your um, NIO. And if you do see any damage to it, you're gonna wanna get rid of that plant. Instead of putting that plant in the green waste like we typically would, you're gonna wanna put it in the regular trash so that it goes to H power and get burned. All other islands, you want to also pay attention to your NIO. And if you do suspect any damage, be sure to immediately report it to 643 Pest, since it'll launch a early detection rapid response from that island to try and prevent it from becoming established. So what are some of the impacts of NIO thrips? Well, it impacts our native NIO plant. And they harm them by sucking the tissue out of the leaves um, and causing severe damage that leads to a defoliation and eventually death of the plant. And NIO trees are a really important component of our lowland and coastal dry forest and actually comprise roughly one half of the plant biomass in the Mamane NIO forest ecosystem. So they're a really important plant for that ecosystem. And you can see the damage. Um, circle it here on the plant, that kind of galling, crumpled look is damaged from the thrips. How are they moving around? Well, they're really small bugs that can fly and get caught easily in the wind. Um, and they're moving around on NIO. So it's just important to, if you're transporting NIO that you make sure that it's really free of these thrips so they don't get introduced to a, a new location. If it's going a new location in between islands, um, you wanna make sure you follow all the rules and have the implants inspected by Hawaii Department of Agriculture before shipping. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, make sure you're paying attention to your NIO and report any damage that it has to 643 pest. All right, so that's wrapping it up for me for now. And I'm gonna turn it over to Erin to take us through the Rami Moth. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, the last five pests that we'll go through are some that are not detected island-wide, or I'm sorry, statewide, they're on specific islands. The first one is the Rami Moth. This was first detected on Maui and then later on Hawaii Island. Places you wanna look out for this moth are nurseries, farms, trails, and yards, and it has impact on our agriculture and environment. 
The rainy moths are native to Southeast Asia. They have been spread by people to the Philippines, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and now they're here. Um, during the fall of 2018, uh, this was the first time it had been found anywhere in the United States, and that was on Maui. And then two years later in 2020, it was detected on the east side of Big Island. Um, the issue with this is that the larvae from the uh, rainy moss feed on our native plants in the nettle family, and this includes mamaki and olona. Um, this also hosts plants to our native butterfly, the Kamehameha butterfly. Some of the threats that I talked about is that um, it does impact mamaki and it does so quickly. Um, so it will defoliate mamaki plants and this is in direct competition to our endemic uh, Kamehameha butterfly. The high risk pathways for this is the inter-island movement of host plants. And these are really any kind of nettle, but specifically mamaki and alona are some things that are commonly um, native plants that are transported inter-island. The response to this is that management research is being explored. Um, they're looking at ways to try and contain this pest, both on Maui and Big Island. Um, there is potential for predation by established native and introduced parasitic wasps that might help. But as of right now, um, all islands are encouraged to report any suspect Ramy moss so that they can target these areas and really get a, a good idea about how fast it's spreading and where it's spreading. There is a lookalike for the rainy moth and that's the Kamehameha butterfly. Um, not in its adult form though. The rainy moth is sort of a small brown butterfly. Kamehameha butterflies are big and showy, almost like a monarch. But when we look at their larva, that's um, really what you're gonna see feeding on the plant anyway. So what we would like to point out is that rainy moss in the earliest instar, that's the youngest larval um, stage, is that rainy moth moves in an inching motion like an inchworm and the Kamehameha butterfly has a smooth crawling motion. When they get a little bit bigger, they start getting some color to them. So the rainy moss will have white hairs while the Kamehameha butterfly has black spines. The rainy moth has a black head. The Kamehameha butterfly has a green head. The rainy moth has really bright red spots on it and the Kamehameha butterfly will have none of those. And they can have different color morphs. So Ramy moths are either yellow or black body. Um, Kamehameha butterflies are green or brown. So really the thing to look for is if you see a caterpillar and it has these red spots, that's gonna catch your eye and you wanna make sure to report that. Things that you can do to help prevent um, the spread of Ramy moths are check your plants for suspect caterpillars. Uh, a lot of us do have mamaki or if you're hiking, you might see mamaki. Um, and you wanna check it out, see if you see any of those um, caterpillars with the red spots. And if you do, please report the damage to 643pest.org and it's helpful if you can take a picture. Um, just because Ramy moths are not um, spread island or statewide, we wanna make sure that plants moving between islands are inspected by Department of Agriculture and this is a rule that's actually in place. So before you ship any plants off island, um, you should have them inspected by Department of Agriculture. And um, here we have the email. So if you have more questions about offices where you can get inspections um, conducted, and these are free. The next one that we'll talk about is devil weed. Uh, devil weed has been detected on Oahu and also Big Island. Places to look for this pest are farms, pastures, trails, and roadsides and its impacts are agriculture and also our health. It's an aggressive colonizer of pastures and farms. Um, this is an issue because it's also toxic to livestock. And it's not necessarily that livestock will target this plant to eat, but what ends up happening is that sometimes they will accidentally ingest it, especially in pastures that have a high infestation of this plant. It is a skin and respiratory irritant because when it blooms, it um, can irritate the respiratory systems, especially people that are asthmatic. And it has a lot of oils in its leaves that can be that skin irritant. It makes 800,000 seeds a year. So that means that it promotes these huge thickets. And then also with the dry stems and that high essential oil content in the leaves, it is listed as a fire promoting weed with the Pacific Fire Exchange. 
It's native to North, Central, and South America. Um, and in North America, it's really Mexico, um, places in Texas and Florida where you can find this plant. It is highly invasive and was recognized invasive in India, Africa, Southeast Asia, and across Southeast Pacific Islands like Guam. And in Hawaii, as I said before, we've only had it on Oahu since 2011. And most recently it was detected on Big Island in 2021. Um, the things that we would like for you to keep, keep in mind with this pest is that it is an agriculture and fire promoting weed, which is why we wanna contain it and keep it under control. The high risk pathways that we're seeing um, is that locally, because it's an aster, it spreads very easily with the wind, but these long range dispersals, especially what we've been seeing on Big Island, or I'm sorry, on Oahu, is that when we had the first detection on North Shore, we saw it popping up in areas on the South and West sides. We knew that wasn't wind dispersal, so this means that it is hitching a ride with people and our activities. So this could be anything from hiking shoes, um, if you motocross or mountain bike, and then also with off-road vehicles and construction gear. So the best thing that people can do um, is make sure that their gear is clean. And even though on Oahu it is no longer eradicable, we are still trying to suppress it to slow the spread because it is such a terrible agricultural pest. Um, Big Island is still doing an eradication control and it's not been detected on any of the other islands. So what we would like people to do is no matter what island you're on, please report this pest. If you're on Oahu, we're gonna note the location. We'll tell you how to get rid of it. We can even help you if needed. Um, Big Island, they're gonna come out and do surveys so that they have a good idea about where it's spreading on that island. And then all the other islands, it's gonna trigger an early detection rapid response. It's sort of a cryptic looking plant, but things that you can look for is that it has this triangular shaped leaf. Um, the leaf has two leaf margins. And then when you look at the veins, it almost looks like a devil's pitchfork. It has very three prominent veins that go from the base of the leaf up to the tip. And sometimes you can see this purple growth on the new leaves. Another thing you can think about is when you see this plant, um, if you take a leaf and crush it, it's gonna have an odor to it, almost like turpentine or kerosene. Um, so the things you can do, the best thing you can do is clean your shoes and gear to stop the spread. This means before you start recreation, um, make sure that you are not having muddy shoes, muddy tires, um, or muddy bikes. And when you start your hike, that way you're not introducing this weed. We'd like for you to report this plant to 643pest.org. It's great if you can submit a picture. Like I said, it's kind of cryptic and it looks like several other plants. Um, that's why photos are helpful. And then if you're on Oahu and you would like to join our volunteer activity, this helps in suppressing the plants because we remove them along trail sides. You can contact us um, via email and that's just oisk at hawaii.edu. Uh, the next one that we'll talk about is tree daisy, and this is um, commonly called Asa Peixe. This is native to Brazil, and it's been detected on Maui. Places to be on the lookout for this plant are farms, pastures, and roadsides, and it impacts our agriculture as well as our environment. The tree daisy, or this Asa Peixe, is native to Brazil. It was actually first reported by a retired state forester on Maui um, in Haiku. And this was in 2021, so this is a very recent detection. The tree had never been documented in Hawaii before. Um, when they found it, they asked um, biologist Forrest and Kim Starr to take a look at the area and they had some aerial images. And that's what you're seeing here on the right-hand side. So this is the same area in 2008. In 2015, you can see that the grasses have moved in. This is a fallow area. And then by 2019, all of those sort of light green spots that you see above the grass, that is the tree daisy. So you can really see that in less than um, just about 11 years, this plant moved very quickly. So it's an aggressive colonizer of open spaces like pastures and farms, and it quickly dominates. It's also shade tolerant, which is a concern for our native forest. Um, things that are shade tolerant find it easy to move in and take over space, things like strawberry guava, myconia, and now this tree daisy. It was also um, evaluated by the Hawaii Weed Risk Assessment, and it has a score of 14, which is very high. It is invasive in Africa, 
um, specifically Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And currently we only know it to be in that one area in Maui. Um, the way that it got to Africa was that this is um, a plant that's beloved by bees. So yeah, next slide. And it was exported there in the 1990s as a nectar plant for the winters. Um, but it quickly invaded and was thriving in open agricultural fields, pastures, lands, roadsides. Um, and it soon began to impact the agriculture communities and economies, um, but it also created a significant wildfire threat. The seeds travel easily by wind. So once it gets into an area, it can spread very quickly. Um, but in Zimbabwe, it actually now dominates the regions it's infested. Um, within 25 years, it's the dominant canopy plant. What we would like for people to do is um, report it, no matter what island you're on. Currently, MISC is conducting surveys to determine the established range of this um, tree, the shrub or this tree. And what they're trying to find out is if it's something that they can control or eradicate, um, or is this something that they're going to have to contain until they can find effective tools. Um, what you'd want to look for for this plant is that it is a shrub to a small tree. It grows up to be about 20 feet tall. And it has oblong leaves with a smooth leaf edge. And what really stands out are these showy flower heads of white and pale pink flowers. So that's usually what people notice the first are those, um, a tree just filled with blossoms. Things that you can do is you can clean your vehicles and equipment to stop the spread, especially um, farming equipment or construction equipment. Another thing, again, is to have your plants inspected by Department of Agriculture before you ship them. And if you see this, or if you suspect that you see this, no matter what island you're on, please report it with a photo to 643pest.org. Uh, the next plant that we'll talk about is Phoenix nettle. This was detected in Hawaii Island pretty recently. Places to look out for this are roadsides, trails, and yards, and the impacts are to our environment. Um, it was in late 2017, BISC botanists collected some mystery plants on a trail, um, and they were doing early detection surveys on the Kona side. And it was pretty easy to overlook. It's sort of an innocuous looking plant, kind of cryptic, um, no real eye catching characteristics, but what they started to notice and trail users also reported it, um, they started seeing it growing in thickets and there was um, being very aggressive in its growth. So that's something that they took notice of. Uh, so what this did is they reached out to some partners. They were trying to identify this plant, but nobody recognized it. And so they worked with Smithsonian botanist and finally in 2020, and this is three years later after finding it, they were able to identify this plant. Um, and it turns out that it's this Phoenix hirtus and somehow it had made its way to Hawaii and they're not sure. Um, it's native to Central America and right now it's only on Big Island. The issues with this plant, it's also shade tolerant. It has really aggressive growth patterns. So it creates these dense thickets and it will shade out all other plants. It does have a lookalike, and this is also a way that you can try and look for the plant. Um, its lookalike is also in the nettle family. This is our native mamaki. Um, the phoenix nettle, though, is going to have these dry brown fruits attached at the stem, while mamaki fruits are fleshy and white. And then the leaves are a little bit different as well. The phoenix nettle leaves are more narrow and they have green veins, while mamaki has a reddish color underneath with red veins. So if you can remember, if you see a plant that looks like mamaki and it's got these brown dried seeds, um, seeds and fruits, you'd wanna report that. The threats that um, posed by Phoenix nettle, it's like I said, it is shade tolerant. It has a very agro aggressive growth pattern, but it's in direct competition with our native mamaki plants. And mamaki are very important understory plants and they provide a very important um, provide a role in the systems of watersheds and the water capture. They're also the main host plant for our native Kamehameha butterfly. The high risk pathways really aren't known for this. So locally it's gonna spread via wind dispersal, um, but they're not sure how long the seeds last, uh, the viability of the plant. There's really not a lot of information about the life cycle of this plant. So there's some research going on to try and find and identify some of these high risk pathways. 
Um, the response for this is any island where you suspect you see Phoenix, please report this. Uh, but on Big Island where it has been detected, BISC is working to contain the spread of plants by removing them from trail sides. Um, and like I said, there's more research going into the life cycle and maybe we'll find some better tools to try and manage this plant. Uh, things that you can do are clean your shoes and gear always. This helps stop the spread of invasive plants. Um, be on the lookout when you're hiking. So if you're familiar with mamaki and you're hiking and you see a mamaki, maybe it doesn't look right, or maybe take another look at mamaki to see if it has those brown dry um, flesh, those brown dry fruits, then maybe it is the phoenix nettle. And we'd want you to report that with a picture to 643pest.org. And so the last target species we'll talk about, um, for those of you on Oahu, you're very familiar with this. This is the red vented bulbul. Um, it has been detected on Oahu and it's widely established, but there's been a recent detection on Maui, which um, may have been why people have been seeing it in the news. Areas that you wanna look out for this bird are farms, roadsides, trails, and yards. And it does have pretty um, severe impacts to agriculture and the environment. Um, the impacts is that it's very aggressive and territorial, so it will chase off almost all other birds in the area. It's a voracious feeder of crops, um, and it's also a distributor of invasive plant seeds. And if I could get the next slide. It's native to Pakistan and Southwest China, um, but it has been introduced to Pacific Islands. In Hawaii, it's been introduced on Oahu, likely through pet, um, accidental or intentional pet releases um, in the mid 1960s. And because it's been here so long, there really isn't a place, Malka to Makai, that you can go and not see these birds. But the recent detection on, in Maui has triggered a response to try and find these birds and stop them from becoming established like they are here on Oahu. So on Oahu, we have two types of bulbuls, um, the red vented and the red whiskered. They're both considered invasive. So no matter what island other than Oahu, um, we'd want you to report any of these birds. The bulbul though is actually one of the world's 100 worst invasive species. Um, so this is the one that they had found on Maui. It's a very dark bird. It will have a crest. Um, some things that people think maybe look like it are the white rump shama um, and the cardinals. The cardinals because they have the crest, the white rump shama and the common minor bird because they have flashes of color. The um, red vented bulbul is a dark bird, but it will have those red feathers um, near the base of its tail. The threats is that um, it will, like I said, it's very aggressive, but it's a known spreader of invasive plants like myconia. And because it will establish in the forest as well as the lower elevations and um, around people's yards, it is a pest for agriculture and in our, our environment. The pathways are maybe kind of surprising. There really aren't a lot of high risk pathways for this bird. It's not gonna fly island to island on its own, but it is a potential hitchhiker. Um, it can get stuck in cargo containers and then hitch a ride on a ship um, and also illegal intentional introduction as pets. Um, so it's illegal to do so um, by Hawaii state law. This is an injurious pet, so you cannot release this anywhere. The response and management, except for Oahu, we want people to report all suspect birds that would try and capture the bird to stop it from establishing so that it won't have the effects and impacts that it's having here on Oahu. Um, things you can do, don't introduce bull bulls or really any other animal into the environment. If you have a pet, you can take it to Humane Society if you no longer can care for that pet. If you have an illegal pet, you can drop it off to the Department of Agriculture um, with no repercussions. It's an amnesty program. So um, if you do have an illegal pet, please uh, surrender that to the Department of Agriculture. That way we can prevent it from getting out into the environment. Another thing is just be on the lookout. Um, early arrivals to other islands are usually seen near ports. So these are airports and harbors. So if you find yourself in an area, take a look around. If you hear something or see something that you're not sure about or never have seen before, we ask that you report that to the 643pest.org 
and submit a photo with that as well. And so I know we went through a lot. Um, we covered a lot of information and we absolutely don't expect anybody to remember what species is on what island. If you walk away with anything tonight, we really want you to understand that no matter what you see, if it's weird, you've never seen it before, you think maybe that's odd, just report it to the 643pest.org website. They don't get too many reports and it's always better to be safe than sorry. Um, so like if you wanna report a global on Oahu, that's absolutely fine. They'll just let you know that they're widespread. But if you report a bulbul on any other island like Maui or Kauai or Maui or Big Island, you might just be stopping them from establishing there. Well, mahalo ladies so much for this presentation. It was amazing and I learned a lot. So I hope all of you out there learned a lot. Um, we would just like to thank you all um, for being here tonight. Um, as we've learned, early detection is key to an efficient and cost-effective response to invasive species. A major challenge is having funds available to respond to these emergent pests when they are detected. One way you can be an advocate for rapid response is by supporting funding to tackle these problems before they become too overwhelming. Submitting testimony in support or opposition of issues that are important to you is very easy. You can also contact your local legislators to voice your concerns. This Advocacy 101 um, graphic that you see on the right-hand side in blue um, can guide you on how to submit testimony and contact your legislators. Um, you can also um, take a picture of the QR code on the left, and that will take you to cgaps.org backslash resources um, for, for this uh, graphic. And so with that, um, we did not have any um, one mention any questions in the, com in the chat box or the question and answer box. Um, so with that, we have a few more minutes. If there is anyone that would like to um, ask a question while we still have the presenters at hand, now is the time to do so. Um, if not, we just would like to send a big mahalo to all of you for joining us this evening. And we hope you folks have a great weekend and a happy new year.